Hello, welcome to this session of uh, ACUR at ANU. My name is Jules Lombers and I will be chairing this session today. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional uh, lands we meet and whose airways we share um, and pay respect to elders past and present. Um, before we kick off today, I would like to uh, just let uh, any of our attendees know that um, some of the topics discussed today, um, there may be some sensitive topics covered. Um, so there, this is a bit of a, a content warning. We will put some um, resources, uh, some um, uh, some um, contacts into the chat uh, later on in case anyone feels that they need to reach out for support. Um, and if you do feel you need to log off um, or um, and you're welcome to log off and log back in later, please feel free to do so. Um, but I just did want to flag that with you. Um, however, uh, without further ado, I would like to please introduce our first presenter, um, Emma Brown. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open up my presentation. Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, my name's Emma Brown, I'm going to be a presenter and I'm going to discuss with you um, personality as the missing piece in the body image puzzle. So while there is a consensus um, that online environments like social media can threaten our body image, um, emerging research is also showing um, that personality is also an influential factor um, in people's experience of body image as well as body appreciation. So in terms of body appreciation, um, what is it? And body appreciation um, we're going to look at is, what it is, is um, it's defined um, through feelings of favourability, respect and acceptance towards one's own body and it's an emerging construct in positive body image research. So we're going to have a look at why um, we would study uh, body appreciation and why it's important. Um, so it's important um, because it, it warrants ongoing concern. And in the absence of um, absence of body appreciation, negative um, body image is actually associated um, with risks of higher, higher risk of eating disorder onset, poor self-esteem, and also symptoms of depression, um, which you could see um, in that diagram that I've got there for you. So we're gonna have a look at um, this study um, that was done and what we looked at. So we looked at body appreciation as our outcome variable, and we we're wanting to understand the influence of personality and how that was associated um, with body appreciation. So we looked at um, personality in terms of the big five personality traits. And although it's multifaceted, um, it is argued by Costa and McRae that it comprises of these five universal enduring traits, which are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism there. And extroversion and neuroticism are the particular two traits that this study focused on. So we're having a look there at defining neuroticism. Um, it's also uh, termed emotional instability, and it's characterized by the experience of negative emotions, anxiety, impulsiveness, self-consciousness, and more of a predisposition to self-consciousness and perfectionism. And some existing literature has found some links between um, neuroticism and um, lower, um, ex lower, lower body appreciation being experienced. Um, our other personality trait that we're investigating here is extroversion or also how outgoing someone is. And that is seen through things such as positivity, uh, sociability, assertiveness and excite excitability. And there's some links here that have been um, made between um, extroversion and um, positive associations with body appreciation. So we'll have, have a look at what our hypotheses were for this study. And I propose that um, the more extroverted somebody is, the higher their body appreciation would be on the left there. And on the right, um, also hypothesize that the higher um, someone scored on neuroticism dimension, the lower their body appreciation would be. 
and we're going to have a look at how um, these variables were tested. And this was done using a cross-sectional design, um, measuring correlation, uh, sorry, producing correla co correlational um, data. And we used self-report through an online survey and we had um, ethics approval through um, our university there as well. So the participants who were involved in our study um, were 74 undergraduate students and they were enrolled in a particular course um, called Personality and Assessment at University of Sunshine Coast. They were aged between 19 and 57 years old and we have our mean age there as 26.97, so around 26 years of age and our standard deviation shows that there was a bit of variation um, above and below that figure there as well. 85% um, of our participant cohort identified as female. Um, we had 13.5% identify as male and 1.5% who reported um, their gender as non-binary. Um, the ethnicity for the norm sample here was 93.2% um, um, of our participants um, identified as having Caucasian ethnicity. Now, the type of questions that our participants were asked um, were drawn from reliable, extensively validated assessment tools. And these included the body appreciation scale and the big five inventory of personality. So body appreciation um, was gauged through statements such as, I feel good about my body, and participants self-reported um, whether these statements were true for themselves, never, seldom, sometimes, often, or always. And extraversion um, was measured through um, statements such as full of energy, outgoing, sociable, and extraversion was part of the, um, the big five inventory of personality. And then we had neuroticism um, was gauged by questions such as worries a lot or temperamental and gets emotional. And these could be rated from agree um, strongly, um, sorry, from disagree strongly um, on a Likert scale through to um, agree strongly, depending on um, how that ex um, characteristic um, applied to them. Now that we had all of the data from our participants, um, we'd collected it, we totaled all the scores and divided across the categories and um, non-identifiable information um, was, um, was what we did. So it wasn't identifiable or traceable back to an individual. We created mean scores um, and standard deviations for each dimension and through the statistical package for social sciences, which is SPSS, we produced some Pearson correlations to show how these variables were related. So first of all, um, we established a main effect, and this was a positive correlation um, between extraversion and body appreciation. And you can see the um, strength of that correlation there. And this was consistent with some of um, my previous research as well. Um, secondly, and potentially more concerning um, as well, were our findings for that neuroticism dimension. Um, and a large effect of size was observed through a statistically significant negative correlation. And this was that R value of um, negative 0.74, so quite a strong correlation at a significant value of 0.001. And these um, results, as we found there, were between neuroticism and body appreciation. So this alarming statistic shows that individuals scoring higher on that neuroticism um, scale um, were more likely to have reported a lower body appreciation through the body appreciation scale. So we're gonna have a look at what the implications um, for these kind of findings are. So first of all, I'd like to draw your attention to the importance of understanding these big five personality traits as research has shown that they're somewhat enduring um, throughout our life stage. So there may be some change, but they're somewhat enduring. Um, and this is not a distant problem. So it's not just something happening to someone else somewhere else. Um, there's, it's worthwhile to consider that a friend, a family member, an associate, somebody within your network um, may struggle with developing or maintaining positive body image and acknowledging that there's mental health and physical health associations with these as we've discussed. Um, so points that sustained attention on research and intervention is certainly required, particularly for these at-risk groups. And we're gonna look at um, some theoretical um, frameworks and theory um, that could potentially help to inform um, some interventional work around this as well. So we use the self-discrepancy theory here as proposed by Higgins. And at the top, we've got that idea of emotional vulnerability and viewing the self in terms of our actual self as we are, our ideal self as we'd most likely to be, and our ought self, which might be influenced um, by factors such as the media 
and society and internalization of these beliefs um, on ourselves. So comparing ourselves through this, through these different states, particularly in a body image context, um, gives rise to self discrepancies. So these um, between these standpoints, which can often lead to more negative psychological states as well. So it's important to understand the context, um, this in the context of developing more positive body image and building a body appreciation. And researchers are looking into the role of um, acknowledging these beliefs and how they could help in overcoming things like self, self criticism. So um, we're going to look at um, overcoming self-criticism and this um, requires self-compassion which can be practiced through mindful awareness of negative thoughts and feelings and this is opposed to engaging with over-identification with them and this is particularly applicable to contexts where we look at the media and having awareness of um, how the media influence us. And that led, us, um, led me to make my main um, recommendation around media literacy intervention um, which was uh, critical thinking um, about our media consumption. And this um, in turn would help to aim re and reduce internalization of some of these unrealistic, but unfortunately prevalent um, ideals around beauty and around weight and body image that are often expressed throughout our media and society. Um, so where to from here? Um, we'd like to conclude uh, that hypotheses for this study were supported through the research. Um, research such as this is part of a growing field of research into this area and that future research direction um, could serve to look into experimental design which could mean we could test some of those interventions like mindfulness um, like some of our media literacy programs and compare participants body appreciation and body image before and after these Thank and also so looking at um, other personality traits. Yep. Thank you very much Emma that was really good. Thank you. Um, you'll have seen that I have popped some um, uh, some contacts into the uh, chat there for anyone who may need to reach out for support as well. Um, sorry if that was distracting for anyone, but I just, um, upon recommendation from our presenters, um, we had discussed this before, I have just popped that in there. So um, for anyone who came in uh, late for attendees, um, we did just discuss that there may be some content in these presentations um, that, uh, that some of the content um, may, um, if, if any, anything in any of these presentations um, um, has any, um, raises anything for you, please do reach out for support. Um, we now have five minutes of um, question time and I'll pass first to the judges. Um, so um, Sally or John, do either of you have any questions? Um, yes, can I ask a question? Emma, um, thank you for that. Can I just ask what was it that made you choose that theory in particular? Um, I chose that theory um, because I was interested in a little bit of that role of the media, even though my um, my work wasn't specifically on that, um, but that theory I felt was applicable um, because we 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 do have um, that that there is a tendency um, to compare ourselves in some ways, I believe, um, and looking at um, kind of projections of uh, of um, society and media on how we should be um, versus um, ourselves as our current state and how we feel about ourselves and that. Um, body image is very subjective so um, it's not um, any body of any weight and research has shown um, in, in my research that these effects are not just in one gender group so they're across genders um, across different age groups there's a lot of studies on college uh, college students but there's other age groups involved um, so it's not just one particular um, type of um, type of BMI or anything like that that um, suffer from these kind of um, things it, it, it is quite widespread so I felt that that was very relevant um, in a subjective context to people. Thank you. I hope that answers your question there Sally. John did you have any questions? Yes actually I do have two um, but before that um, thanks Emma for the great talk. Um, so you. I guess the first question is about the sampling so if I'm not mistaken um, all of the subjects um, that participated in this research were from the psychology major. So I was just wondering if you think that might have given rise to any sampling bias um, or like 
yeah, in other words, how transferable is the uh, results? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, I, I can um, hear what you're um, saying there. Um, so yeah, you are correct. Um, they were um, drawn from a psychology class. So most of those um, participants would have had a psychology major um, and, and out of who we studied. Um, in looking at other research um, that has used samples beyond psychology students, um, although the effect size, particularly for those neuroticism associations, weren't quite as high as what we, we found, um, they were uh, still they they were still shown um, in broader <coughs> excuse me in um, in broader populations of college students and other um, studies that have used participants that were not college students. Um, relied on things like snowball sampling, where one participant would recommend another and recommend another, and that did um, that that was found um, suggested to lead to bias. So I think in in some senses um, our our participants um, are somewhat generalizable to a larger population, particularly if we if we had had a larger sample size. Um, but yeah, maybe opening it up to more broader broader um, college students and undergraduate students in general, um, we could even get a greater sense of the field and what's going on um, in this in this um, field of research. Thank you, John. Yeah, cool. Um, well reasoned. Um, yep. Um, I've got another question, and it's about the correlation coefficient that you've chosen. I think yes. I only see the Pearson correlation. So just wondering if you. Um, considered um, using the other types of correlations as well, like the Spearman or the Kendall. Yeah, just, just wondering. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So in, in this um, in this instance, we only use the Pearson um, correlation. Um, this was for an undergraduate third level um, uh, report. Um, and we were looking at if in the future, um, in my report, I recommended that if we were able to get a larger sample size, um, in the future that we could actually subject these results to more rigorous statistical analysis um, and look at post hoc testing and further things to try and ascertain what um, what other effects we could um, find within and between subjects as well. Cool, sure, thank you. Fantastic, well done, thank you Emma. Um, we only have a few seconds left, so um, we won't have any more time for questions unfortunately, but thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move to our second speaker, who will be uh, Laura Mobbs. So we'll move to Laura. Thank you when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Mobbs and I'm currently completing my psychology honours at Macquarie University. And over the past year, I've been researching the body image construct, in particular, the relationship between muscular body ideals and body image disturbance. My goal was really to determine whether paying attention to muscular bodies could make us feel and look less muscular. I'll just share my slides with you now. Body image disturbance is a cause of great stress amongst the general population, and it is associated with the development of clinical disorders such as anorexia nervosa and muscle dysmorphia. Body image disturbance has two principal components, an attitudinal component involving negative feelings about one's body and a perceptual component involving misperceiving the shape and size of one's body. The attitudinal component of body image disturbance is commonly known as body dissatisfaction. And I was particularly interested in body dissatisfaction relating to an individual's muscularity. This is known as the drive for muscularity. The drive for muscularity represents an individual's perception that they are not muscular and that they should increase their muscle mass. It has been proposed that this drive for muscularity is a result of the internalization of unrealistic body shapes and ideals presented by the media and through social comparisons. Over time, this pressure to increase your muscle size has increased dramatically. For example, researchers have demonstrated that the GI Joe action figure has become extremely unrealistic and that their level of muscularity is simply not attainable, even for the most advanced bodybuilders. As you can see in the image on the screen, the progression of the GI Joe toy from the 1970s to the 1990s. Drive for muscularity is a clinical concern as it is often related to individuals ad adopting excessive weight training routines or using steroids to increase their muscle mass. 
Strive for muscularity is also a central feature of muscle dysmorphia, which is a misperception that one's muscularity is insufficient, regardless of their actual body size. But what is causing this distorted perception? The answer to this question lies in the perceptual process of visual adaptation. Visual adaptation is the process whereby prolonged exposure to a stimulus results in a subsequent stimulus appearing distorted in the opposite direction. This distortion is known as an after effect. For example, see this castle. What color is it? This castle is a black and white image. I now ask you to pay attention to the dot in the center of this inverted color. Please remain staring at it for a few moments. Soon, I'll transition it back to the black and white image and it will suddenly be a fully colored image. Please remain staring at the fixation point. And it is now a colored castle. Well, see how this after effect occurs? The same after effect occurs after you have been exposed to certain body types. In recent years, after effects, just like that castle after effect, have been demonstrated to occur to particular and extreme bodies. Studies show that exposure to low fat or high muscularity bodies make subsequently seen bodies appear in the opposite direction. The differences in an individual's perception of muscularity is typically measured by determining and comparing their point of subject normality, PSN. Furthermore, this adaptation has also been found to impact our body dissatisfaction with adaptation to stimuli of low muscle or high fat in decreasing our body dissatisfaction and vice versa after adaptation to high muscle, low fat stimuli. Previous studies have demonstrated that adaptation to idolized body images can impact an individual's body perception and body dissatisfaction. But these studies fail to account for why only some people experience body image disturbance while others do not. The current study proposed that it was an individual's visual attention that determines whether they experience the body after effect and subsequently body image disturbance. Previous studies have demonstrated the role of attention in visual adaptation by directing a participant to attend to either a high or low fat body image in a paradigm where both images were presented at the same time. This resulted in the typical after effects of attending to the low fat body decreasing PSN and then tending to the high fat body increasing PSS. However, it is not known whether a visual attention affects muscularity after effects in the same way. Therefore, I proposed a study which would determine whether paying attention to a high or low muscular body would have an impact on the participant's drive to muscularity and their perception of a normal body. I predicted that attending to a high muscular body would increase perception of muscularity and drive perception of muscularity and drive to muscularity, and the opposite would occur for attending to a low muscular body. The study consisted of 81 participants split into a high muscle condition and a low muscle condition. These conditions determine the stimuli that the participants would attend to. The study began with all participants completing a drive for muscularity questionnaire to establish a baseline level for drive for muscularity. Participants then adjusted test bodies via a 2D body manipulation tool to a size they perceived as normal to establish their PSN score. This is an example of five of the 25 levels. On the screen, you can see level five, 10, 15, 20, and 25. This video demonstrates what the participant would view. This is from level one to level 25, if they were to manipulate it. You can see that the muscularity is gradually increasing. After these initial tests were done, they then ex were exposed to a period of adaptation. This is similar to when we were adapting to the colored version of the castle. Participants in the high muscle condition directed to attend to the high muscle stimuli and participants in the low muscle condition were directed to attend to the low muscle stimuli. For example, the participant would be instructed to either look at the person in blue or the person in yellow dependent on their condition. Following this period of adaptation, the participant would then recomplete the body manipulation test and recomplete the drive for muscularity questionnaire. This established their post-adaptation score on both measures. 
The difference between the participant's score on their perception of muscularity and their drive to muscularity before and after the adaptation were then calculated and examined. The results showed the difference in PSN scores between baseline and test was significantly different for participants who attended to the high muscle stimuli compared to the participants who attended to the low muscle stimuli. The participants who attended to the high muscularity images experienced a significant increase after adaption and participants who attended to the low muscularity images experienced a significant decrease. The results revealed no significant effect of adaptation on drive for muscularity. This is disparate with pre previous research which has shown adaptation impacts body dissatisfaction. This difference could be perhaps a result of differences in methodology or different measures used. More research is required to establish a more consistent impact of body after effects on body dissatisfaction. These results provide evidence for the role of visual attention in muscle after effects when two bodies are presented simultaneously. This is important as it provides evidence that not all bodies within an individual's visual environment contribute equally to after effects. Therefore, an individual's attention patterns may enhance body size misperception. This means that individuals with attentional biases towards body shapes, such as low adiposity or high muscularity, may experience higher levels of adaptation and consequently more body image disturbance. This finding has significant clinical implications for understanding the underlying mechanisms of body image disturbance and therefore can also be utilized to inform treatment strategies. For example, it may be possible to retrain individuals with high body dissatisfaction through cognitive based training to stop attending to idolized bodies such as extremely thin or highly muscular bodies. Or on a more simple level, just click unfollow for individuals on social media such as social media influencers, bodybuilders and models, as by having their images in your social media feed may impacting and making you feel more fat or less muscular than you actually are and subsequently impacting your body satisfaction. To conclude, I hope my study can expand our understanding of the attentional biases of individuals with body image disturbance and thus provide vital information for potential treatment interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Excellent. Very eye-opening and fun. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I would now like to pass to the judges. Um, do either of the judges have any questions? We have five minutes. Yep, um, if I may go first. Um, thanks, Laura, for the very interactive talk, even though it's just one way. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> agree with Jules, that is really fun. Um, so I guess this is more of a general question. So when you are comparing the scores, the difference in, in the scores prior to and after uh, your experiment, um, I think it did comment that, that um, the difference is significant. I assume that some, some sort of quantitative values such as the p-value were computed. Um, so I was, I was just wondering um, what's considered as a threshold? Like, is there a consensus of a threshold of value in this particular field? Um, they were significant if they were under 0 0.05 and right, all right. the effects and the Cohen's Ds were all small to medium effect size. Cool, okay. Thanks for the answer. Sally, did you have any questions? Um, no, I was going to ask something similar, so it's, um, it's been answered well. It's fine. Okay. All right, so um, in that case, I'd like to um, pass to anyone else. If any attendees um, or other participants have any questions, please feel free. Um, so if any attendees would like to ask any questions, you can raise your hand or pop them into the Q&A box. We've got um, probably got time for a question and maybe two. Um, yes, uh, Tina. So I, I am very interesting um, presentation, by the way. I loved it. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering, though, because a lot of like body image and I mean, the drive for 
like bigger muscle mass and everything is a, a lot of it is driven by social media and media in general so how, how does that like I don't feel like you kind of address that in your presentation much so what one of my fellow researchers was actually conducting a very similar experiment at the same time and she did a media literacy campaign before and after exposure to these idolized bodies on social media and her focus was social media when my focus was the visual adaptation the perceptual the neural mechanisms behind it okay yeah makes sense thank you great thank you um, any other questions? Probably got time for another one. Nope. Um, Laura, I will ask you um, which, um, what um, what why your what is your interest in this area? What's driven you to research in this area? I was really interested in it because I've noticed over the years my social media feed has it suddenly really increased all these really muscular men and they're really skinny models and they've been selling these body ideals. And I was really interested that I'd always heard about it from this social media perspective, but I'd never really understood why it was occurring or the neural mechanisms behind it. Mm. Yep. All right, last call for a question. All right, sounds like you've done such a good job. There are no questions. Okay, in that case, we will move on to our final presenter, who is Tina Lynn. So when you are ready. Thank you, Tina. All right, cool. Um, eating disorders and oral health. Who would have known that there was a link between the two? Did you know that each time your stomach produces did you know that your stomach produces acid that is strong enough for it to damage your teeth each time you vomit? Did you also know that the damage caused by eating disorders can be irreversible without early intervention? Not many people actually know this. This isn't common knowledge. People who experience a long-term eating disorder are involved in practices such as self-induced vomiting, binging and starvation. Combined with a lack of nutrients, the appearance of their teeth become discolored, chipped, and change in shape. This creates a greater risk for poor, poor oral health outcomes for people with eating disorders. It affects their quality of life and exacerbates signs and symptoms in their eating disorder. Knowing this, it highlights a need for oral health promotional resources to be developed for people with eating disorders for a couple of reasons. One, there is a lack of oral health resources specifically catered to people with eating disorders. So some might not actually know or be aware of the damaging effects at all. And two, just like any other disease or illness, we need educational resources to exist in order to raise awareness about the long-term damage of eating disorders on oral health. And three, Having an oral health resource produced for people with eating disorders will promote engagement from consumers and healthcare professionals, which will lead to health promotion. Once we have our full set of adult teeth, they'll be the ones that we'll have for the rest of our lives. So as an undergraduate student, I had the opportunity to work on this project with a team of supervisors and academics over eight weeks for the summer, summer, summer scholarship program at Western Sydney University. So the aim, as you can see on the slide, the aim of the project was to collaborate with stakeholders to develop and pilot test a resource to support oral health promotion for people with eating disorders. It involved two stages. One, or well, the first one, the development. Second, the piloting process. And research was a big part in initiating the project. So that's exactly where I started. I began with a systematic search for peer-reviewed and grey literature across multiple electronic databases such as PubMed, ProQuest and Clinical Key. I looked for literature that contained information on changes to oral health seen in people with eating disorders. I also looked at 
um, published oral health promotional resources to see what was already available and what key messages were being conveyed in those resources. Any relevant articles um, or resources were again updated in EndNote throughout uh, the whole process for referencing. I collated key messages and information that I gathered from literature, journals and brochures even. Using Word um, helped me to organise those messages into similar themes and it, it allowed me to determine the frequency as well. Um, and at this stage, it was a matter of transferring that information into a visual format. So there were quite a few factors to consider when it came to creating this resource. It included the consideration of age and cultural demographic, sensitivity of messages and readability, just to name a few. So it was important to represent the right demographic, to include content that was appropriate and that the level of language used was easy to understand for the general public. We're developing this brochure as an oral health promotion resource. So this required multidisciplinary input from numerous stakeholders. Feedback was sought from academics, representatives of the Southwestern Sydney Local Health District, National Eating Disorders Collaboration, and from the Australian Dental Association about content, readability, and the layout of the brochure. So to demonstrate, here was the initial draft I had created. Based on the data collected, the demographic of people with eating disorders was primarily composed of adolescents and young adults. You'll notice the strategic use of um, stock images to appeal to that demographic as a means to draw attention and relatability. As an oral health promotional resource, we aim to promote health literacy. So the brochure has been examined to have the readability suited for an 11 to 12 year old for an easy read. You're currently looking at the first half of the brochure. On the very right is our title page with selections of pictures that closely represent the social culture of, young, of the young generation of Australia. Moving towards the left, there is more information about accessing services. The intention of an educational resource is to also raise awareness and educate about the available services that exist. I'll now like to draw your attention to the second half of the initial draft. It's where the bulk of the research was presented. At first glance, um, it must be acknowledged that there is quite a bit of text, however, uh, this side of the brochure was mainly focused on the educational element of the oral health promotion. It's been split into three sections, as you can see. Uh, why does oral health matter to me? Signs and symptoms, and what can I do to prevent teeth and gum problems? On the very left, the impact of eating disorders on oral health is addressed. It cautions poor oral health and its effects on quality of life. These were key messages I extracted from the research conducted during the earlier stages of the project. Following that, we have common signs and symptoms listed on the bottom, and these were most commonly identified in journal articles and other sources. It actually helps to identify these signs and symptoms as a way of educating consumers of what to observe and look out for. And as you can see to the right, you'll notice that it's primarily filled with oral health promotional messages. These are practices recommended by or suggested by um, dental health practitioners. For example, brushing your teeth twice a day, flossing daily. Not all people with eating disorders purge, but if they do, it's recommended to um, rinse with water first after vomiting and waiting before brushing their teeth. The very right contains more prevention-based messages that would help reduce poor oral health outcomes. This includes attending bi-yearly checkups at the dentist and making dietary changes. Since receiving feedback from stakeholders, changes have been made to the brochure itself. The pictures on the front page have changed to be more diverse in age, gender and culture. There is more variety in the list of support services as well. On the other side of the brochure, noticeable changes were also made to the layout. The, the messages are now more succinct with the use of appropriate images 
And from the left, um, the dot points under the first heading have been condensed to two points only, and for that to just highlight the cause and effect. In the middle, education has been provided for people with purging habits. So for example, you can probably see that acid wears away the teeth enamel. And on the very right, health prevention messages have been condensed to three main points. Uh, so that provides more details about benefits and consequences of particular lifestyle habits. Now, the project is currently in its second stage. And after receiving feedback from peak stakeholders, we've been able to start piloting this resource. So the current draft that you just had a look at, that's the brochure that we're using to receive feedback from or through a survey link from consumers. Um, this feedback will determine whether more changes need to be made to the actual brochure or if it's ready to receive final endorsement from previously mentioned key organisations followed by a wide dissemination by New South Wales Health. And though the project is still in progress, um, it has received support from many large organisations, including New South Wales Health through funding. This resource will greatly benefit consumers and the general public in understanding the effects of eating disorders on oral health and increase engagement from people with eating disorders as they learn about how they can be taking care of their own teeth and the available support services. As a result, um, the brochure will strive to raise awareness about oral health for the general population and aim to decrease the poor oral health outcomes amongst people with eating disorders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great initiative. Okay, um, I will now we'll move to our five minutes of questions. Um, so I'll pass first to the judges. Do either of the judges have any questions? All right, um, I guess I'll, I'll go first. So, um, yeah. um, so I was actually judging together with Sally yesterday as well, and so she might have known about this. So I was telling the participants um, yesterday that um, I, really really like numbers like on on slides and stuff like that um so i was just wondering if tina um you think um whether you could think of any charts or graphs that you could make and put on these brochures to help with your um aim and and if so what sort of data do you think you could sort of collect or like what what, what do you need to make these sort of charts or graphs yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, I think the the purpose of the brochure itself was to be uh, more educational, and I can see why like charts and statistics would be um, helpful in, I, I suppose, like emphasizing um, again, like why there is a need for that first of all, um, for like there is a need for oral health. Um, to be addressed amongst in in people with eating disorders, um, I am not sure because, like like I said in the presentation, the brochure itself is to be addressed for the general public, and um, wondering if we were to start including statistics, if that might be too overwhelming, because. Um, like, I think, yeah, like dealing with eating disorders and body image, like those are very sensitive topics in itself already. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that would trigger anything like that. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it certainly yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like there are many things to consider when it comes to developing a brochure as, as well. And like this was my first time being involved in a project like this. Um, so... Yeah, I had to learn a lot of that kind of stuff as well. A lot of questions of why, um, but perhaps like down the line, we could have a different kind of brochure that can have more statistics like that. Yep, yep, appreciate your answer. Um, yeah, I totally understand. So it's mm. just curious as well. <laughs> oh, good. Ellie? Um, hi, Tina, that was great. 
Um, look, just out of interest, I just wanted to know what sort of um, seems to be like an intersection between a couple of disciplines. Like, are you, like was this like a psychology project or a marketing project or a um, where where was your where was your core discipline? Um, yeah, so it's quite a combination. We've got, uh, it, I would say, it was a collaboration between Western Sydney University and cohort. So cohort in itself is um, mainly based on a, like a oral health sort of discipline. And because um, the collaboration was between cohort and Western Sydney University, the nursing and midwifery um, school, school of nursing and midwifery. So, and because um, the summer scholarship program has a bunch of various different um, projects available for students to be a part of. So we, it's not really solely nursing and midwifery and it's not solely cohort as well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that really answers your no, question. No, it does. I was just trying to determine if it was sort of like innovation in, in terms of research, like it's an innovative kind of, um, a research direction it's, it was good it's not a um yeah it was just a question thank you okay. yeah oh, we just lost john but that's okay this is recorded um we've only got about 30 seconds left so probably not really enough time for a proper question oh he's coming back um so um i I'm going to ask a very, very quick question, which is just um, why wait 30, why, why wait 30 to 60 minutes to brush your teeth after vomiting? Can you answer that in 20 seconds? Uh, okay, so um, apparently uh, because once, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, okay, don't worry. I just, I'm just thinking on your brochure. It's there's probably some why questions. That's time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, that's um, time up for um, all of our presentations today. I would like to say a very big thank you to our judges, to uh, John Ting and to Sally Davis. Um, and well done to all of our presenters. You've done a fantastic job. It's been very informative. And also, although sensitive topics, also um, not only informative, but I've really enjoyed and learned a lot today as well. So thank you very much. I'd also like to um, remind our attendees, um, there are some uh, phone numbers um, in the chat there. If you should need to reach out for some support, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of your evening and um, enjoy the rest of the conference as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great job, Emma, Laura, and Tina. Thank Thanks, you. Joel.